from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Okay. Hello. Good afternoon. I'm Ron Charles, editor of the book section of the Washington Post, which is a charter sponsor of the National Book Festival, and we are so glad you're here. First, a word of thanks to our co-chairman of the festival, David Rubenstein, and the many other sponsors who've made this possible. And if you'd like to make a financial contribution to the festival, there's information in your program about that. We'll have time for questions afterwards at these two mics. Know that if you come up to the microphone, you will become part of the library's permanent collection. So if that's not something you want to do, stay in your seat. I am so delighted to be here today with Geraldine Brooks. I've known her for years now since she wrote one of my favorite novels, March. <clears throat> the moment I finished it, I boldly called her on the phone, out of the blue, a stranger, choked up, kind of crying, and told her how much I loved it. She has since changed her phone number, <laughs> but she still is happy to get email from fans. Geraldine Brooks was born and raised in Australia, which accounts for her lovely accent. She came to the U.S. to complete a master's degree at Columbia University and soon got a job for the Wall Street Journal covering conflicts in Africa and the Balkans and the Middle East. That experience provided the material for her first book, Nine Parts of Desire, The Hidden World of Islamic Women, which was an international bestseller. Several years later, after winning an Overseas Press Club Award for her coverage of the Gulf War, she took off the journalist's cap and wrote a novel called Year of Wonders. <clears throat> Somebody in the audience just told me that was their favorite book ever. <laughs> Encouraged by the success of that novel, she published a second one called March, based on the life of Bronson Alcott and the father figure in Little Women, and it went on to win the Pulitzer Prize for fiction. Since then, she's published two more celebrated novels, People of the Book and Caleb's Crossing. Now, all of her novels have been dramatic works of historical reclamation and imagination, but her upcoming, her new book, <clears throat> A Secret Chord, is her most ambitious work yet. A Secret Chord, The Secret Chord, is about David, King David, ruler of Judah, ancestor of Jesus, Michelangelo's subject for the first Abercrombie and Fitch model. <laughs> the story is incredible. I mean, I thought I knew this from my Sunday school days, but wow. I mean, it's got war, intrigue, betrayal, sex. It's one spectacular scandal after another, even by Washington standards. <laughs> you are in for a treat. For Geraldine Brooks tells us about her inspiration, her research, and her work to bring this ancient hero to new life. Please join me in welcoming her. Thank you, Ron. You really are my hero. <laughs> he is just the best. And may I just recommend to your attention, uh, Ron has another hat as well as being an erudite book reviewer for the beloved Washington Post. He is also the totally hip book reviewer on YouTube. And those of you who haven't had the pleasure uh, of seeing his work there, Ron. So I, um, I'm, I'm a kind of person who tends to be as, as zen as possible about doing events like this, but um, uh, thank you all for coming. It's hard to be zen with this many people in the room. Uh, and particularly uh, when I read the author instructions that the National Book Festival thoughtfully uh, sends to us, and it said, um, be personal, so that's okay. So I, I uh, loaded up a PowerPoint with some slides of my kids, <laughs> which I will show you soon. And then they said, don't use any notes. And I'm, what do they think we are? We're people who spend 90% of our lives alone in a room because we're really quite shy. <laughs> don't use any notes. Uh, as you see, I am flouting that <laughs> instruction. Um, I will try not to refer to them too much, but like uh, Linus, I need my security blanket. I hope for your understanding. But um, to, to try and fulfill the requirement of being personal, I thought I would share with you um, 
some information about the thing I collect. I think most people, uh, or many people, have collections. Some people have coins or stamps or bobble-headed dolls. Um, I collect examples of unhelpful signage. <laughs> Watch for falling rocks is a perennial favorite of mine. Uh, it's the rare ones I treasure, like a bird watcher heading to Antarctica or to the Galapagos in search of the blue-footed booby that can be seen nowhere else. I like those signs that you have to travel to get. And a lot of them are in my home country of Australia, in far north Queensland, where the roads are often more notional than actual. <laughs> There's uh, the sign that says, drive according to prevailing conditions. <laughs> Even better at a place aptly named Big Hole in the Northern Territory. Accidents can lead to injury and death. <laughs> um, there was a sign I saw on a, over a, an expressway in Florida that at first looked like helpful information. Texting while driving kills. Fair enough, I thought. And then I noticed at the bottom of the sign it said, for more safety tips, text <laughs> hashtag safety. But perhaps the prize in my collection is the sign on the car ferry that goes back and forth to my home on Martha's Vineyard. Um, for your safety, please exit the freight deck while the vessel is underway. <laughs> I love that sign. Every time I see it, it makes me laugh because I get this vision of all the vacation SUVs with their bungee corded extrusions of bicycles and kayaks and spare blankets and pillows and all the holiday paraphernalia, obediently driving off the freight deck <laughs> into Vineyard Sound. And I thought, well, that's one way to thin out the August crowds. <laughs> so why do I like these signs so much? It's because they remind me how magnificently complicated our language is and how difficult it is to convey precise meaning no matter how well-intentioned you are. Somebody at the Martha's Vineyard Steamship Authority probably put a lot of thought into that sign and getting it made up in nice high-vis lettering and they just wanted to advise people to get out of their cars for the duration of the trip and yet they totally blew it. So I keep little sticky notes of these signs on, uh, on the desk in my study, and it's to remind me to be extra careful with this fragile treasure, our language. But like the Steamship Authority whiz, I often blow it too. Uh, the difference between the right word and the wrong word, as Mark Twain told us, is the difference between lightning and the lightning bug. <laughs> and when you're writing historical fiction, the stakes here can be quite high because if you put the wrong word in a character's mouth, you can pull your reader out of the time and place that you're trying to keep them in. And that is unfortunate. So um, I've done that, I have to admit. In, in Year of Wonders, my first novel, I have my 16th, uh, 1665 young heroine waxing eloquently about the mauve tide of the heather moving across the mountainside of her Peak District home place. Problem, the first use of the word mauve as a color wasn't until 1796. Um, I know that because somebody actually wrote a book <laughs> titled Mauve, how one man invented a color that changed the world. Whoops. <laughs> so it was not long after that novel came out, and I think I was speaking about it in England, and um, I met a wonderful English novelist called Jim Crace, who uh, had written a book set in biblical Israel called Quarantine. It's a wonderful novel. And he was telling me about how he researched that novel, and a lot of his research 
had to do with um, camping in the Judean desert to get the sense of the place. And he said on the first morning of this camping trip, uh, his Bedouin guide woke him with a cup of lovely cardamom scented Arabic coffee and said, Mr. Jim, how did you sleep? And he said, Ahmed, I slept like a log. And then he said he raised his eyes to the bare rock ribbed hillsides of the Judean desert. Not a log to be seen. <laughs> so he turned to his guide and he said, Ahmed, how did you sleep? And Ahmed said, Mr. Jim, I slept like a dead donkey. <laughs> so ever since Jim Cray shared that story with me, um, I've spent a lot of time going over my manuscripts and trying to find logs and turn them into dead donkeys. So I hope when you read my books, you'll find a lot of dead donkeys in them. Uh, it's not always easy. In, in The Secret Chord, for example, uh, which is set in Second Iron Age Israel, uh, I kept running into a lot of logs. Uh, I had to take out the word assassin because the original assassins were a violent Persian sect of the 11th century and it's not likely my Hebrew tribesmen would have been talking about them. Uh, I substituted the word thug, only to realize that that was actually a violent group of uh, Indian outlaws uh, from the 15th century, and my Hebrews would not have been talking about them either. So I didn't find a really good dead donkey in that case, but sometimes you can find them, and I think that the effect is well worth the effort. So in Caleb's Crossing, my young narrator needs to talk about a fetus. And I'm pretty sure that in Massachusetts in 1660, she's not using the word fetus. And lucky for me, there's a wonderful resource, the Oxford Historical Thesaurus of the English Language that digs down on every word in use from today all the way to early Icelandic. And so if you look up fetus, you can go down to mid-17th century and found, find that the word she probably would have used is shapeling. If you put the word shapeling into her mouth, I think you can time travel. So does it really matter? Is it important or is it just nitpicking? An expression I have to say that I've loved for its aptness ever since my son got head lice in the third grade. <laughs> really is very exacting work. Um, but I think combing through a manuscript looking for bad vocabulary is in, in some ways very similar to nitpicking. And I think it does matter. And I think it's respectful to you, the reader. And I'll tell you why. Um, not that many years ago, I had a wonderful year as a fellow at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Studies at Harvard. And um, this is a, just a terrific boondoggle. They pay you to do your own work and to have lunch with other fellows who come from a diversity of fields across the sciences and the arts and academics. And you give each other ideas and it's just a great experience and your only obligation is to give one talk on what you're working on and go to the talks of your fellow fellows. So one of my fellow fellows was a mathematician from Bordeaux and uh, her talk was entitled Singularities in Algebraic Plane Curves. <laughs> and I have to tell you I slumped into that lecture room. I took a doodle pad and I thought if I positioned myself behind a pillar, a short nap might not be out of the question. Math was not my strong suit. Um, but on that pad that I carried that day, I found that my doodles quickly turned to notations of what she's saying. And here's a couple of things that I wrote down that she said. A formal power series about the origin is an infinite sum. Homomorphism is an isomorphism if and only if the matrix 
is invertible. This is like poetry, I thought, and I leaned in to hear more. She was eloquent and she was passionate, and what she did was, as soon as I gave up the idea I couldn't understand a word she was saying, she cracked open the airlock and showed me a glimpse of her world. And I now know that it's a beautiful world. What she was doing was trying to find that place in every curve that is singular, and she was trying to express more perfectly the truth about the world. And I realized that that is what I, as a novelist, also must do, is to delve in and find the singular and get as close as possible to the truth of the world as I can. And so it's a beautiful world, but I can't live in her world because if she's got lungs, I've got gills. I work completely differently, and my work is all about words. Um, I didn't start out as a novelist, I started out as a journalist and I loved every step I took in that um, occupation. But when my son was born 20 years ago, I realized I no longer wanted to be a foreign correspondent going off on long open-ended assignments. And so I had to see if I could do something else. And I wrote Year of Wonders and lucky for me, many of you wanted to read it. So I got to keep doing that. But I have that son uh, to thank for the inspiration for my most recent novel, The Secret Chord, um, because when he was just nine years old, he took the very unusual, I think, decision for a boy of that age that the one musical instrument he was interested in learning was the classical harp. I had been braced for drums, so I didn't resist the choice. But it was watching him, dwarfed by his teacher's beautiful concert instrument, that set me back to thinking about David, that other boy harpist, that musician whose music was so powerful that it could soothe the mentally ill and even please God in heaven, so we're told. And I had been a fine arts major in college and I'd been very interested at the in the various depictions of David in Italian Renaissance and Baroque art, this shepherd, this warrior, this musician, this complicated man, um, this man that we know, perhaps before we know any other human being in full from early childhood to extreme old age. He's really the first political biography we have. Uh, a man who is very recognizably human without a lot of supernatural interventions in his life. And when I went back and read the books of Samuel, I realized that absolutely everything happens to him in his long life. Every good experience and every bad experience, every powerful emotion that the human heart could encompass. And I wanted to tell the story. But I like to tell my stories with a first person narrator. And I wasn't sure who that should be in this case. I knew it couldn't be David himself because he wouldn't have enough objectivity to look at his own character and he certainly wouldn't be able to um, effectively tell the story of the women in his life because if he had have understood them, he wouldn't have treated them the way he did. And then I came across um, two references in the Book of Chronicles, intriguing references to the Book of Nathan. And those two quotes that tell, uh, tell us that the life of David, all his acts from first to last, have been set down by the prophet Nathan, really inspired me because those of you who paid attention in religious school will remember that Nathan is the one man who's brave enough to confront the king about his moral failings. He's the one who tells David that he has completely betrayed his own best self, tells him what the consequences of this will be. And when you read his ferocious castigation of the king, you wonder, what was the career path for that guy? Because usually if you say that kind of a thing to a king, that's the last thing you get to say. But what's wonderful about this story is that David 
accepts responsibility, accepts the truth of what Nathan has said. And how unusual is that? When have you ever heard a politician say, yep, you got me, I did it. No, it's always, I did not have sex with that woman. Oh. Um, he said, yeah, I did, that was really wrong and I shouldn't have killed her husband. And then he brings Nathan closer so that at the end of his life, it's Nathan that he turns to, to resolve the issues of succession and to make sure that the king who succeeds him on the throne is the one son who should do that because he's Solomon who's come down to us as the byword for wisdom and good governance. So I knew my narrator was going to be Nathan, but I wasn't sure what his voice would sound like. I imagined at first that he would have a very tough voice, that this would be a power broker, a, a mafia consigliere, <laughs> or maybe a Thomas Cromwell, uh, Henry VIII's dark eminence. And then I thought, maybe something really creepy. But Nathan didn't want to be any of those guys. He refused to speak in that voice to me. He had something completely different in mind. He wanted to sound like these guys. He wanted to be unworldly. He wanted to be idealistic. He wanted to be the light in the story. And I, of course he does because he's a Hebrew prophet. And that's what these guys are like. That is how they roll. They're the ones who bring us to our best self. So I had to give in and let him be that guy. But then how is I going to research this book? Usually I dive into archives and read all the journals and letters and uh, court records where you can hear people in verbatim testimony speaking in their own voice so I can get the sound of the language in my head. That wasn't going to be possible in this case. So I realized that I would have to... Um, do a more exper experiential kind of research, and I took a leaf out of Jim Crace's book and headed off to Israel with my younger son. I told you there would be family photos, and here's one. Um, I love exploiting my children as research assistants. <laughs> they see things very freshly, and they ask questions that we wouldn't think to, uh, to ask. So I thought, what can we do that is similar to the kinds of things that David might have done 3,000 years ago? Not the adultery and the murder so much. <laughs> uh, herding sheep was the first one because, of course, so many leaders in the Bible start off as shepherds. And I was wondering, what is it about the business of herding sheep that turns out to be a great entry-level position for future CEOs of Israel? Um, and I found uh, in that long afternoon that my son and I were herding those sheep on the uh, hillside in uh, Israel that you have to understand those that you're trying to lead. We were trying to separate the sheep from the goats, which turns out to be just as hard in real life as the metaphor suggests. And you can't do it until you understand that goats react differently to pressure to sheep. So once we had that insight, I realized that I was going to use that and let uh, David have that kind of insight about leadership. Um, so uh, we then, we did other things. We stayed in the desert in goat hair tents, eating the kinds of foods mentioned in the Bible, and we drew water from ancient cisterns to feel the effort involved. And we rode camels, um, only to find when we got home that we'd got a sore backside for nothing because there were no camels in Second Iron Age Israel. <laughs> and mules were what we should have been focused on. And we went to the places associated with David, like uh, the Valley of Elah where he battled Goliath and the caves of Ein Gedi where he hid out from King Saul. And we went into the dig under the old city uh, where... Uh, excavations from the Davidian period uh, being unearthed and um, I, uh, I have to say that there's a lot of tension there because uh, Israeli archaeologists are doing the digging but it actually runs under a Palestinian neighborhood and it's causing their houses to collapse and there's tremendous tension around this site and it just reminds you that the battles that David fought are still going on 
So I've only got a few minutes left and I want to leave time for questions. So I'm just going to go quickly to say that my baby harpist grew up to be a big harpist. See, I warned you there would be family photos. Um, and on the way, he was having his bar mitzvah and because of the connection with David and the harp, he decided to play his harp at his bar mitzvah. And he chose to play a beautiful uh, arrangement of Leonard Cohen's wonderful song, Hallelujah. And so I not only owe him the idea for the book, I also owe him the title because the first line of that song, of course, is they say there was a secret chord that David played and it pleased the Lord. But it's the, it's the seldom sung later verse that I think really sums up David. Uh, the verse that goes, there's a blaze of light in every word. It doesn't matter which you heard, the holy or the broken, hallelujah. And David is holy and broken. And I think we all are to some extent. And I think that that duality and that complexity is what makes him such a fascinating figure and keeps drawing us back to him. Thank you. And we've got microphones here, and I urge you to all become a part of the permanent collection of the Library of Congress, and happy to take questions, comments, abuse of any kind. <laughs> and don't be shy. No, no, yes. Uh, so I just want to say, first, I love your books. I've read all of your fiction. And one of the things I love about the historical fiction is that you take a subject about which there's very little or nothing known, like the Year of Wonders, and you weave this whole story. And so you're not really messing with history, because I love history. Um, so I love that about your books, that and many things. And I've read The Secret Chord, and the minute I finished it, I felt bereft because I'm going to have to wait for your next book, and I would just like to know how long are you going to make us wait? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. And, and I love what you said because I do try and follow the line of fact as far as it leads. So I sort of need two things for a book. I need an intriguing true story from the historical record, something that you wouldn't make up because, you know, I love Mark Twain and Mark Twain said, fiction must be plausible and truth needn't be. <laughs> so I'm always looking for those implausible truths like the fact that a, a village quarantined itself voluntarily during the plague or that a, a Native American raised in his own language and culture mastered Latin and Greek and graduated Harvard in 1665. If I made them up, it wouldn't be so exciting. The fact is that those things happened but then the second thing I need is that there not be too much known about them because if Caleb, the Native American, had kept a journal of his time at Harvard, there'd be no space for me. And it's because we don't know much about his experience. The only way to engage with it is through uh, imagination. So I need the void as well as the skeleton of intriguing fact. So yeah, thank you for that. But I do like to make sure that as far as we can know, I go to a lot of trouble to know before I start swan diving off into invention. And how long till the next book? I wish it was going to be quicker. Uh, it does seem to take me about the same amount of time to do all of them, which seems to be about three years. So, Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, say thank you for coming. Uh, as a hopeful Australian writer of yes. historical fiction, I very much enjoy listening to you. Uh, you talked a little bit about what you need for your inspiration to write. And I was curious to hear about how you, how you choose. You know, you write about all these quite diverse subjects and there's just so much out there, like there are stories everywhere. How do you choose what to write about? So it just seems sometimes, you know, I, I think, Ernest Hemingway had it right. He said, an idea for a novel can be something you're lucky enough to overhear or the wreck of your whole damn life. <laughs> and luckily for me, it's been the former rather than the latter. And the novel I'm working on now actually literally was something I overheard at a lunch table. I was at Plymouth 
plantation. They'd invited me because they liked Caleb's Crossing and they had it in mind to pitch me an idea for a novel uh, about somebody from the plantation and they knew a lot about her. And it doesn't usually work very well if somebody brings you an idea because they, they're giving you that idea because it's just like something you already did. <laughs> and I don't want to do that again. And I exhausted my, you know, enough Calvinists already. <laughs> so, um, but while I was at this lunch, I started overhearing the conversation at the other end of the table. And it was an incredibly intriguing story about a horse from the uh, 1860s. And I found myself not even pretending to pay attention to the nice people from Plymouth Plantation and wanting to say, could you shut up? I need to hear what he's saying. <laughs> so I will be writing that book next. Um, but they do just seem to sort of, sort of flutter in the window like lost birds sometimes. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for being here, and thanks for re retweeting my tweets. Um, <laughs> I've, I've never missed you at the book festival, I've seen, and I've read every single one of your books. Well, thank you. So, very much. in the three years that we wait till the next um, next novel, what what authors or subjects inspire you, and what what authors would you recommend that we maybe pick our pick up in the interim? Oh uh, well, I think my favorite um living writer is here this weekend that's marilyn robinson i'm completely in awe of her i think gilead and the gilead trilogy in fact is just an amazing work of art and similarly i think hillary mantel i wish she would stop doing screenplay adaptions and plays and get on with finishing that trilogy about cromwell because i cannot wait to read it um, I read a tremendous amount of fiction. I just gobble it up, and I like nonfiction also, memoir. Um, I just read a book that might not have crossed the transom of many people here. It's, by, it's the first novel by a New Zealand novelist called Anna Smale called The Chimes. It's dystopian, a dystopian future uh, where the world is organized by music and I thought it was one of the most remarkably inventive things I've read. She's a poet and a violinist, so she knows what she's doing with language and music. <laughs> um, so I loved that. And then um, a little memoir called uh, The Point of Vanishing, which is a, a story, a uh, true story of a young man at Harvard who has a horrible accident that destroys the sight in one eye and sends him into a tailspin and he goes off to live in the woods a bit like Thoreau and he's a worthy successor to Thoreau. Thank you. So, um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Your books have been a thread throughout the four different generations of my family and uh, we really enjoy reading them and each of us has our favorite. Oh, that's um, lovely. And I was curious, I imagine writing a book, each is, is so distinct, but if, if in the, the different processes of writing your different novels, if there was one novel that you enjoyed writing the most and if there's one you enjoyed the final product the most. Huh. You know, that it sounds like a cliche, but they really are like your children and it's really hard to pick a favorite of them because they're all bound up with that time in your life and you remember exactly where you were, what room you were in when you were writing them and how old your children were and the various struggles that you had around writing them and you know you, you always love your first novel. Um, I, I have to love March because it brought me the Pulitzer Prize and you know there's nothing wrong with that. You know people sometimes say doesn't it put a lot of pressure on you and I go hell no. <laughs> And, you know, so it was so outside of anything that I even would have imagined was possible. I was so shocked the day the phone rang and it was a, 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 an old colleague of mine actually from the newspaper. I used to work the Wall Street Journal and he thought I already knew and he's like, this is so great, this is so wonderful. And I thought it's three o'clock and Ken's been out to a long lunch. What is he talking about? And he said, you don't know, you got the Pulitzer Prize. And I said, don't be so ridiculous. I haven't done any journalism. And I hung up on him. <laughs> and then, you know, of course, everything explodes. And I realized that unlikely as it seemed, this was true. And somebody's coming to the door with flowers. And I'm on the phone to a newspaper reporter. And 
My son, who was eight at the time, opened the door and said, Mom can't come. She's really busy. <laughs> she just got the Pulitzer Surprise. <laughs> So I'm sorry, I can't really <laughs> narrow it down to one. Okay, so I'm getting the wind up. Can we just take one more question? One more. Okay. I've loved your writing, all your books, but um, I, the one I recently finished was Caleb's Crossing, and I love the part where the scholars are all so skinny because they can't afford anything at Harvard. They can't afford to feed them even. Um, and yes. I just wondered... Harvard what, did not have an endowment in no, those days. No, <laughs> not at that time. I just wondered what was the um, overheard conversation or the... Ah, that was a notation on a map uh, of the island of Martha's Vineyard. We'd just moved there as year-round residents, and I was intrigued to have Native American neighbors for the first time. So I went to the tribal uh, headquarters and got all the materials. And it's a fantastic tribe, you know, because they've never been displaced from their land and they're fantastic custodians of their culture. And they had this map of the island with all the notations of the place names in Wampanoag language and places of significance. And right near where we were living, it said birthplace of Caleb, first Native American graduate of Harvard. And my eye couldn't actually accept that the next bit was 1665. I had to read it as 1965 because it was so beyond what I would have considered possible. And then when I found out it really was 1665, I was, how did that happen? And what was it like? And then I was off to the races. And that's generally how it goes. Thank you. Thank you very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.